Hey, thank you, Greg, for that reminder that it's 11. I got carried away talking to some folks this morning. Glad that you are all here. And uh, it's time for announcements. Is that right, Greg? Announcements. Okay. So let me see if I can get these announcements right. Today's Sunday. It's the first Sunday of the month. So we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper in just a little bit. So that'll be great. And then after church, we're going to have the First Sunday Fellowship upstairs. I saw a counter with a bunch of food up there. So if you are able to, invite you to stay after the service today and join us for that celebration as well in a time of fellowship. If you've got time before you go out and look for a lobster this afternoon. I know the season opened back up today and uh, everybody was out there on the water when I crossed the bridges this morning. Um, and then tomorrow night, men's Bible study, wrapping up 1 John chapter 5. Um, people showing up around 6.30, pizza at 7, finishing by 9. And then we're going to have uh, the month of August off for Bible study. So get the kids back in school, uh, get ready for fall, and we're going to start back up on Wednesday. Maybe it's uh, is September the 6th or Wednesday, Yolanda. I remember that day, yeah. praying for you. Uh, and we're going to do a uh, uh, co-ed Bible study uh, starting that Wednesday night for nine weeks. And that'll be on the book of Daniel. So we'll be studying that together. And then in November, we'll go back to our separate men on Monday nights and ladies on Wednesday night. This week, of course, uh, normal schedule with the Tuesday community ministry, if you want to be a part of that. I think that is all of the announcements. Am I right? And today's... Uh, do we have the call to worship on a slide, or are we going... Oh, we're, I see that we're calling up YouTube, and so that's a good announcement reminder that today is Pastor Craig Appreciation Day. Uh, he's not here, and he does so very much that I'm so thankful for. Um, and uh, one of the things that he does is music. Uh, and so since he's not here, he's queued up. Uh, three songs uh, on YouTube for us to sing along with the professional musicians. And so uh, that's what that's what we'll be doing for singing today. Uh, in case you were worried that I was going to lead it, I'm not. <laughs> All right, today's call to worship comes from Psalm 113, verses 1 through 9. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. So many things that he does for us, his children. So just think about what he has done for you this morning as we stand and worship him through song.
Amen. Deacon Greg's going to play one more song. You may be seated. Excellent uh, music leading there, Deacon Greg. Thank you so much. Deacon Greg's going to come up uh, next for our scripture reading for today. But first, we got to transition the sound booth to the slide presenter. Thanks for your patience. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 6. That'll be today's scripture verses.
Good morning, everybody. As Brian said, today is Pastor Craig's Appreciation Day, so we're, uh, sh we're, we're managing to get ourselves through this. We appreciate your patience. Um, is he worthy? He certainly is. Um, this morning, we do a reading from Hebrews 11, 1 through 6, uh, the triumph of faith. Now, faith is an ass the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the man of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the world The blood of the covenant. Okay, I got that ready. First Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup for supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so that is the gospel, that Jesus, the Lamb of God, came and he lived a perfect life and he was sacrificed on the cross of Calvary and he hung there between heaven and earth as payment for our sin and his body was broken, it was crucified, it was a horrific death that he died on our behalf and his blood was spilled. And Hebrews tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or no forgiveness of sin. And so the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, washes our sin. And so as we contemplate these gospel truths this morning, we'll take an opportunity to just pray silently, 
Ask the Lord if there's any unconfessed sin in your life. If he brings something to mind, confess it. Know that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then just have a mindset of thanksgiving and celebration as you think about the fact that God has brought this good news to you through his spirit and that you have been saved through the work of Christ on the cross. So let's meditate that on, on those things for just a moment. Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we remember what you have done on our behalf by sending your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was obedient even to the point of death where his body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us. And you have chosen us to be the recipients of this good news, this new covenant, where you have paid a debt you did not owe and we owed a debt we could not pay, but you have given us righteousness in Christ. And so we eat this bread this morning and drink this cup, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, rejoicing that you have saved us through him, giving you thanks for the blessing of the gospel. And now as we go to your word, we ask that you, by your spirit, would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning's text comes from Acts chapter 14. If you want to find your way there, it'll be in verses 8 through 18. We had a good time this morning in the book of Acts Sunday School, chapter 2. Uh, but this morning, I want to be in chapter 14, and I've entitled it Evangelism Explosion. As I look at what Paul does interacting with this group of people, um, another title could have been a message for the religious. And as we look at this text, you'll, you'll see what I mean. It is a, definitely a religious people. And so by way of stirring our minds to think about this, I'll ask you a question. What does it mean to be religious? What does it mean to be religious? Of course, you being a religious person probably think accurately about it, uh, terms like devotion to God, uh, strict practice of duties that you find in the scripture, uh, observance of vows or promises. And then as we think about uh, examples of religious behavior, you may think about uh, prayers being offered, uh, the reading of the scriptures, the singing of songs as we have done this morning, teaching of the word, uh, doing acts of kindness and service, uh, worshiping the one true and living God. But if you would take that and substitute a lower G uh, for God's and put an S on the end, uh, then you think about idols and images, and you think about people and their tendency to be driven to worship something. I'm reminded of the cult-like following in Waco, Texas, of the man David Koresh and how a group of people literally followed him to their death in misguided worship. 
Uh, to a lesser extent, uh, I think we find all around us in the workplace or at school um, or in the neighborhood even, the common tendency for people to elevate, maybe even worship uh, at times, people. Uh, I think of sports and how we have players and MVPs and you walk down the street and people are wearing their jerseys with their number and their name, um, kind of idolizing a sports figure or a music group where they're wearing the t-shirt representing their favorite band. Music is such a powerful thing and people tend to worship uh, musicians. Uh, all areas of life, we, we tend to gravitate towards people who are exceptional in their field or in their skills, and oftentimes it can become unbalanced, especially for an unbeliever as they uh, devote excessively themselves to a person or a cause that is not the one true and living God. And we're going to see an example of that this morning in Acts chapter 14, but in conclusion to my introduction, I just want to say the bottom line up front is all people are religious um, by nature. And all people need the message to turn from their ways, uh, to turn and repent uh, from their rebellion against the one true and living God, and to follow Christ, His Son. And so Paul demonstrates for us I think, how to interact with a misguided religious people in Acts chapter 14. And so that's why I've called it Evangelism Explosion. So I want you to look at this text this morning and, and put yourself in this situation and just observe how Paul is interacting with his neighbors, how Paul is interacting with the people in his community. And let's see if we can learn how we might better interact faithfully for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with the people that he places in our lives. Acts chapter 14, beginning in verse 8. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, there's loud, loud noise for you, loud voice, he says, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet, he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Father, as we contemplate your word this morning and specifically how you encourage the Apostle Paul to interact with those in his community, we pray that you would teach us how to be evangelists, how to represent the good news of the gospel that Jesus saves. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, first we see a rapid renewal in verses 8 through 10 as we are introduced to this man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. Remember, who wrote the book of Acts? It's Luke, who was a physician. So he understands the medical uh, nature of the body and clearly states to us that this person had never walked. Notice, uh, we don't know exactly what his age is, but he says he was a man. So would it be safe to assume that he's at least 20 years old? 
I just say that because uh, as a grown man, having never walked, that kind of emphasizes the fact that he sprang up uh, when he was healed. I don't know if you've ever had a broken bone and been in a cast for any length of time, but as soon as that cast goes on and you stop using that uh, arm of yours, let's say, the muscles start atrophying. Or in a leg, for instance, if you were to break your leg and that thing was to be immobile for even just a few months, uh, your, your muscles would atrophy, so there would be no strength to stand, much less jump. And everything would tighten up, like your Achilles heel uh, would be just so tight that you couldn't take a normal step because it would be tearing, it would be painful, and the Achilles tendon would be tearing away since it hadn't stretched. And so just from a medical perspective, the fact that this crippled man who had never walked his entire life sprang up, well, that's a miracle. Um, Now, what was it that initiated that? It was his faith. And of course, we know that that is the key to eternal salvation. And it is important that we understand that God works in the realm of faith. And we have to have faith in order to follow him. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so Paul was clearly preaching in this scenario. And this man is listening to him and how Paul knew As he looked at him, he could tell that he had faith, I don't know, through the Spirit of God, I guess, communicating with him as he looked and perceived, hey, this guy has got faith. And, you know, sometimes as we interact with people, as a point of application, you could just tell if someone's with you. If someone's following you in the conversation, if someone is interested in what it is that you have to say, or if they're not. Uh, And so I think we use that as a sign, as a clue, as you go about life, if the person that you're talking to is demonstrating interest in spiritual things, then you invest time in them. Paul stopped what he was doing and he invested in this person because he had faith, he had interest, he was wanting to follow God. And so we too must be observant in our interactions, asking ourselves, is this person that God has brought in front of me interested in what I have to say about the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Paul gives a loud command um, as he speaks. You know, I would think maybe uh, you would understand why it would be hesitant, like, hey, why don't you try to stand up? Let's see if we can get you healed. I'm not really sure if it's going to happen or not, but that wasn't the case with Paul. Paul had full faith. God must have told him, hey, I'm going to heal this guy through you, so just go ahead and tell him to get up. And so he says it with a loud voice, totally setting himself up for embarrassment if the guy doesn't get healed, right? But he does, in fact, um, spring up after Paul said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he said he sprang up and began walking. And so I said that's a rapid renewal. But that's how salvation occurs. It's by faith. It's instantaneous. And know that as we evangelize, the hope is the Spirit of God can do that for every man, woman, boy, and girl who would repent and believe. And so as you're in conversation in everyday life, as you're praying for people that you've had on your list for a long time, know that there is hope for them and that renewal is rapid. It's instantaneous. The Spirit of God can bring a person to life in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So be encouraged by that truth. I'm reminded of Paul's words in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And what a great physical picture that God is allowing Paul to demonstrate here as he calls this crippled man who has saving faith to stand and walk in newness of life. And so everyone is seeing him physically. He's walking in newness of life. So the way he is living out his life is going to demonstrate God's glory and grace and mercy in his life. It's going to bring about conversations that are going to give this crippled man an opportunity to testify to the goodness of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Hey, you're a grown man who's never walked before. How did you just do that? Well, it was a miracle. 
by the God of miracles, and he's the one and only true God, and he can work a miracle in your life if you would just repent and believe. And so God is doing things in your life, maybe not causing you to walk, because you've been crippled your whole life, but he's doing something that will stand out to the people around you. Maybe it's just that smile on your face, the way you're always kind to the cashier at the grocery store. Something that's out of the ordinary that the Spirit of God is doing within you that causes people to notice God has changed you and that gives you a platform, that gives you an opportunity to share with them the most important thing they can ever hear, which is the news that Jesus saves. I'm reminded as this man sat there listening to Paul having faith in the truth that that Paul was preaching, that we as believers are to live by faith. I had uh, Deacon Greg read Hebrews 11, 6, which says, And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And so even in this passage today, we see the crippled man who had faith and God rewarded his faith by healing him. That's not to say that God's going to reward your faith by healing any physical sickness you may have, but he can, he has, he is the great physician and he is a rewarder to those who seek him. So by point of application, may we look at this crippled man and say, I need to live by faith. I need to take what I read and hear in the scriptures and I need to believe that and I need to act on that and I need to order my life in accordance with what God is teaching me in the scriptures. And then for those who are outside of Christ, the point of application is to all. He says, turn from your ways, repent and believe. Remember what Jesus himself said in Mark chapter 1 verses 14 through 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying... Quote, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's our message that we carry to people. Repent and believe. Repent is a military turn. It means an about face, turning 180 degrees. Normally, people are religious and they are worshiping some false god with a little g or some idol that they just like or some recreation or some person. They're about their own agenda, what makes them happy. And God says, no, turn away from yourself and turn towards God himself and believe that Jesus is the Christ. That is the good news of the gospel, that he came, lived, and died, and was resurrected on the third day for you and I, that we might have eternal life. Look for people who are interested in the gospel and share that truth with them and pray for a rapid renewal. Number two, we see a roaring response in verses 11 through 13. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Myconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Are they impressed? Yes. They are thinking that two of the gods, specifically, remember... um, Romans had all kinds, they had a God for just about everything, it seems like. And so, again, men fashion gods after themselves and after what they want God to be. And two of those gods were Zeus and Hermes. Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul they called Hermes. Remember, in Greek mythology, Zeus was kind of the head god. He was in charge, uh, the supreme one, dispensing both good and evil. So apparently Barnabas was standing back, looking very distinguished. Uh, Maybe his physical stature caused them to think that that's the guy in charge. Uh, he, He must be Zeus. And then, of course, Paul, who is preaching, um, obviously is Hermes because Hermes was the messenger of the gods. He was the one that Zeus would send out to tell people what it was that he wanted them to know. So they say, well, this is obvious. Barnabas is is Zeus and Paul is Hermes, the herald. And so they just had a fit. Now, I've read some commentary that talk about a legend um, that there were two of the Greek gods that came to visit this town, Lystra, years prior and no one recognized them and no one showed them hospitality except for this old couple that lived out in the country in a hut and the gods got mad that nobody um, 
entertained them or took care of them. And so they sent a big flood and it destroyed the whole town except for the little hut for the uh, old couple that took them in. And so they say that perhaps these townsfolk uh, remembered this myth or this story or this legend that had been passed down and thought, we're not going to do the same thing that our ancestors did. We're going to recognize when the Greek gods come down and we are going to take care of them. In fact, we're going to worship them and we're going to offer sacrifice to these two guys because they're actually gods. And so that's why you see in verse 13, the priest of Zeus uh, which means it's a very organized religion. They had it together. I mean, they had places to worship. They had people in charge of worship. And so the priest who's on the outskirts of town uh, hears the rumbling and he says, oh, uh, uh, time to go to work. You know, the people are ready to get a sacrifice, so I need to get the things together so that we can all do this right. And I want to be a part of it as well as the religious leader in the town to offer sacrifice. So that's why I say they have this roaring response because they're just all yelling, oh, the gods have come down to us. And in a sense, they're almost right, aren't they? Because God has come down and he is using his apostle, his messenger Paul, to work a miracle which is coming from heaven. Um, but it's there to glorify the one true and living God. But Satan will take truth and he'll twist it just a little bit. And your neighbor or your coworker or your classmate will take something that is beautiful that God has done and give credit to something else other than the one true and living God. So we got to know that people take what you take and they have a roaring response to it, but they don't give credit where credit is due. They make the situation fit into their own box, but they still want to worship. They're religious by nature, and they want to worship, and they try to do that. And so we have to know that about the people that we're surrounded with. They are religious, and they want to worship, and we have an enemy who is busy providing many opportunities for them to participate in misguided worship. And so there are false gods and idols all around us, and we've been commissioned to rescue them. We have been commission to um, intervene and to bring them the truth that will set them free. Jeremiah the prophet back in chapter 14 verse 22 said this, are there any among the false gods of the nations that can bring rain? Uh, that's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. Um, there's <laughs> False gods by definition really don't exist. There's something that are made up in the imagination. They obviously have no power to bring rain. Only the one true God brings rain. And then he asks another rhetorical question, or can the heavens give showers? And then he says, are you not he, O Lord, our God? We set our hope on you, for you do all these things. And that reminds me of Paul's point uh, that we have this treasure in jars of clay. You and I were messengers to the city of Alamorada or wherever it is you live this morning. We have this treasure of the truth that Jesus saves, that he's the one true and living God. And we've been given this truth to share with others because they've been blinded by the enemy and they're misinterpreting the circumstances around them and they're worshiping Mother Earth and, and nature when they see the beautiful water out there instead of worshiping the one true God who created the coral reef and all of the beauty and life that exists out there. So we're up against the enemy who's providing numerous false gods for people to follow, but we know that none of them produce, none of them are true, none of them will fulfill the hopes that our neighbors have, but we have the truth and we know where to, re to direct them with their roaring response to, what a beautiful time I had out there on the water today catching those lobsters. Well, do you know who made those beautiful lobsters that taste so well? Let me tell you. Point number three, we see a rushing rebuke from the apostles, starting in verse 14. And this is kind of where the title Evangelism Explosion came to my mind because Paul kind of explodes in his reaction. And he goes right into evangelism, uh, trying to rescue the perishing. When the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, now remember, it, it said that they were speaking in Lyconian, in verse uh, 11, so although they may have been talking and got excited, you know, as Paul was giving the message, Paul in his humanity 
didn't know what they were saying and maybe he just thought they were excited about the truth of God that he was preaching. But when he found out, when, when they became aware of it, when they heard of it, then they tore their garments. Remember, the tearing of their garments is, is a sign of mourning and great distress. And so it's an expression, an outward expression of an inward emotion that's going on that he can't believe it. He's literally horrified. Because imagine, he, he's preaching to try to point people to the one true and living God. And the response that he gets is they're going to worship him. He's like, oh no, I've completely failed. This has gone off the tracks. This is the wrong thing. Just like we sang in the song, I don't care if they remember me. I just want to point to Jesus. That's my whole aim in life. Don't, don't remember that I'm Paul and certainly don't call me Hermes. Just remember Jesus, that he loves you and that he can save you. And so Paul is out the door immediately, tearing his garments, rushed out into the crowd. And this crowd is is full of emotion, going crazy. I just imagine in my mind some uh, rock concert where people are just out of their mind crazy. They're wanting to worship and offer a sacrifice. And he runs out into the middle of them, crying out. So he's just exploding um, into the crowd and says, Man, why are you doing these things? It's complete disbelief. He's like, this is the opposite reaction that you should have had. And it's a rhetorical question. I mean, he knows what's going on, but it's an indictment to them saying, he's not saying, why are you doing these things? Like explaining it because he's been told what's going on, but rather a judgment, a statement, like you cannot do this that you are about to do. And he goes to give them the reason why. He says, we also are men of like nature with you. I'm telling you, I am not a Greek God, okay? You're trying to give me credit for something that I'm not, and look at me, read my lips. I am just like you. I'm a frail, weak, imperfect human, this side of heaven, carrying the good news of the gospel. He says, we bring you good news, okay? You're in a bad spot. People have to understand that first as you converse with your neighbor. They're in a bad spot. They're worshiping a fairy tale. They're worshiping something that does exist. They're chasing something that's never going to fulfill, okay? They're, they're in a hopeless spot outside of Christ. But you and I, as we evangelize, we bring the good news of the gospel, And what is that? That you should turn. Well, there's that word again. And that's why I say an alternate title is a message for the religious would be to repent. That is to turn. So that's the first thing you got to give people as you interact with them. Look, you're going the wrong way. I think that's a quote from an old funny movie. Uh, You're going the wrong way. You got to tell them first what the problem is. Get their attention so that they listen to what it is that you're saying. You're going the wrong way. You're giving credit to the beautiful ocean and reef to the wrong place. You're not thinking clearly or correctly about what's going on. You have to turn from these vain things. Vain, it's, it's worthless. It's useless. It's not going to produce. It's not going to perform. It's not going to fulfill. It's not going to end like you hope it will end. It is a vain thing. Do not pursue it. Turn from that emptiness and turn to the living God. You guys are are not just worshiping a dead God. You're worshiping a God that doesn't exist at all. It's a figment of your imagination. You need to turn to the one true and living God. Who is this God? He testifies. Well, this is the God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. All three of those realms, everything you've known, seen, experienced, heard, smelled, tasted. The living God is the one who created those. That is who he is. Now, this reminds me about the testimony that God has given to us as people walking this earth. Verse 17, yet he did not leave himself without witness. That's it's talking about God. You're worshiping a false God as if 
you don't know who the true living God is, but I'm going to remind you that he has told you who he is. He did not leave himself without witness. Well, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Well, he did good by giving you rains from heaven. Remember, Jeremiah testified to the fact that it's the one true God who gives rain from heaven. He gave you fruitful seasons. You remember all those wonderful meals you've enjoyed? Well, God has provided those for you. This God that I'm telling you about, he's the one that granted that. Satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. God is so rich in grace and mercy to everyone. So kind to us, more than we deserve. If you've ever had a good day, it's been because God has given you a good day. And he has testified about himself through the ages. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Remember, we're always giving the warning, the rebuke, the charge that God is going to judge unrighteousness. Who, by their unrighteousness, suppress the truth. The truth is, there's the one true and living God. He's the one that causes it to rain. He's the one that gives you breath in your lungs. He's the one that made the reef and the lobsters. That's the truth. And you know it's the truth. And your neighbor knows it's the truth. And your coworker knows it's the truth. And your schoolmate knows it's the truth. But they are actively suppressing the truth. Okay? They're suppressing the truth, verse 18. For what can be known about God, verse 19, is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, that is the essence of who he is, have been clearly perceived. That means your neighbor has seen through the creation who God is, his power and divine nature, okay? Ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. Your neighbor, your co-worker, they know enough to stand guilty before God. So, what does this tell us? Well, my neighbor says that he's an atheist. Do you know what the scriptures say a synonym for atheist is? Liar. The scriptures just told us that your neighbor knows who God is, that he's there, that he exists. Now your neighbor is suppressing the truth in unrighteousness and he's telling himself, I don't believe there's a God, I don't believe there's a God, I don't believe there's a God, I don't believe there's a God. And so he tells you, I, I don't, don't bother witnessing to me, I don't believe there's a God. Well, why are they saying that? Because they know there's a God they know they're guilty. They know they're in rebellion. They know that when dad gets home, they're going to get a spanking and they don't want to receive the judgment of God. And so they're pretending like God doesn't exist. Please don't talk to me. I'm happy pretending that God doesn't exist. They're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Just let me turn up the music a little louder. Just let me take another drink of alcohol to dull my senses and forget the fact that I am going to be held accountable for my actions before the one true and living God. Let me pretend like these other gods exist. Yeah, let me worship them because they're not going to judge me. They accept me like I am. They let me go lobstering on Sunday morning instead of come to church and I don't have to feel bad about it. That's what's happening. And so we have to, in love, correct them with the truth of the gospel. No. You do, believe, you do know there's a God. I am going to tell you the good news that Jesus saves. You do want to hear this, even though you're suppressing the truth. I'm not calling you a liar. God is calling you a liar. God says that you know he exists, and it's plain to you, and that you're going to be without excuse when you meet him. So I want to give you the good news before you have to have that conversation with him. I want to give you the good news that Jesus saved. You just need to turn from your ways and believe in him. So Paul is giving this rushing rebuke because uh, we're reminded in 1 John 5.10, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar. That is, they're calling God a liar because they don't believe the testimony, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. So somebody's a liar. 
Either your neighbor's a liar or God's a liar. I'll let you pick the right answer. We must warn, we must witness. And what is the constant witness that you and I have with our neighbor, with our coworker, with these religious people around us who are inclined to worship? The witness that we have is God's word. It is the scriptures. They have the general revelation, the beautiful keys that they come down here and say, this is magnificent. I can't wait to go back and spend more time there. It's so beautiful. They have this handiwork of God before them saying out loud how awesome he is. That's general revelation. But then you and I, we have this specific revelation of God's word that says Jesus saves. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God. That is, it's inspired. It comes from God himself. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The word of God is all that we need. God has given it to us. We need to live it, learn it, love it, so that we can share it when God gives us opportunity to evangelize with the religious people around us who are wanting to worship something, and we point them to what they really need to worship is the one true and living God. And then finally, we see a rare restraint in the last verse, verse 18. Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. So here you have an apostle of God, Paul himself, perhaps the greatest apostle, filled with the Spirit, working miracles, speaking in power, God's truth. And look, he scarcely restrained them. I mean, barely one, barely kept them from offering sacrifice. So, by way of observation, I see that people are committed to their false worship. If the Apostle Paul, walking by the power of the Spirit in that apostolic era when he was doing miracles, scarcely restrained them from improper worship, <laughs> you and I better be prayed up when we're talking to our neighbor, when we're talking to our co-worker. And expectation management, don't lose hope, don't give up. Don't be discouraged when they resist you, when they resist your kindness, when they don't want to hear the truth of the gospel. Don't be surprised by their hesitancy to respond and drop everything they're doing and say, oh, you're so right, I'm going to follow Jesus now. No, that, that wouldn't be normal. But we continue to spread the seed. We continue to water. We continue to put fertilizer on the plants. And one day in God's perfect timing, by the power of His Holy Spirit, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, He will regenerate your neighbor, your family, your friend, the person He's put on your heart to pray for, that they would come to salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our job is just to present the truth. Our job is, we don't have to restrain them. We don't have to keep them from the false gods. God's going to do that. Our job is just to be there and to tell them the truth, to warn them and to give them the good news. Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. I mean, the whole crowd was out there. It's easy to worship the false gods of Zeus and Hermes. Yeah, let's give them a cow. It'll be good. And then we'll go back, back to fishing. It's easy to do that. And wide is the way. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So, you've been charged to evangelize your neighbor, your family, your friends. But the people that respond to the truth that you're offering are few. So just know that. So just settle in for this long race of life where you're going to go out and you're going to do all you can to live faithfully to the Lord Jesus, to shine your light, to be kind, to share the truth. But most of the time, people are going to say, no, nah, I'd rather worship the ocean. I'd rather worship Zeus. But you never know when God is going to use that conversation with, that you had with them to remind them about the one true living God. And he can regenerate them by his spirit, just like he did Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul was in full rebellion, but he's no match for God to save. And so whoever you're talking to, as crazy as they may seem, they're no match for God. God can save them. You just have that evangelism explosion. You just share with them like Paul did, and you leave the saving up to God. 
If you're outside of Christ this morning, hearing my voice, today is the day of salvation, and the message for you is to turn. To turn from the false gods to the one true and living God. The psalmist said in chapter 95, verses 7 through 9, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. That's always the message. We're never guaranteed tomorrow. So if you're hearing the good news of the gospel today and you haven't responded in faith, today is the day. Don't put it off any longer. Turn to Jesus. Follow him for salvation. And if you're a believer in Christ, well, then the encouragement by way of application is don't grow weary in doing good. Remember Paul's words to the, to the Thessalonians that said such in chapter 3, verse 13. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. I know the crowds are crazy. I know they're worshiping all kinds of things that seem like nonsense to you. But don't grow weary. You just be faithful. And cry out in a compassionate, loving voice, understanding that they're slaves to sin, okay? And only God can rescue them. They're out there catching lobster because they think that's the best thing in life. But you have the good news. Tell them there's more to life than lobster. There's Jesus, and he loves you. You just need to follow him and be persistent and pray for them. Daily opportunities for evangelism to share the good news that Jesus saved. First, that there's a problem. It's sin, it's rebellion, and you have that problem, and you're going to face God, and he's going to judge you, and it's not going to go well for you. That is certain. But the good news is there's forgiveness in Christ, and we are to turn in faith to him Stay the course, live for Jesus, and turn others away from the false gods to the one true and living God. Father, thank you for this gospel message this morning as we see the Apostle Paul evangelize his neighbors and community members. We pray that you would help us to do the same, to go forth and to take the good news that there's one true and living God, and he doesn't look like a lobster that he is the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. Use us to bring men and women, boys and girls, into your kingdom. Enlarge our borders. Fill our church with new believers that love Jesus, that are turning to you for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here. Remember, First Sunday Fellowship, if you're able, come up and join us and uh, have a little bit to eat. Fellowship with us. We love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.